Preparing to delve in three, two, one. We now return to our interview with Ryan Shapples, where we finally got around to talking about Battletech Flashpoint and Harebrain Schemes. It took us long enough, but yes, we, we made it. But before we begin, Ryan sent me a message, uh, because in the last episode, I may have made it sound at the end that he was just writing all of Battletech Flashpoint. Uh, so he sent me a note uh, saying, and I read... I want to make sure it's clear to the listeners that Andrew McIntosh, a really smart and talented guy who also wrote the last two Shadowrun games, is responsible for all the main story content. I'm writing events in the game, and my contribution is pretty dang small comparatively. Also, Brian Pohl, Raymond Wood, and Kiva McGinn were also writers on the project who all contributed more than I did. Video games are a huge collaboration, and I don't want to take more credit than I deserve. Uh, Ryan, you know, staying humble and letting us know that, yes, there's a lot of people that work on this, and one person's contributions uh, may be very small by comparison. So credit to all of the other people that worked on writing this, uh, and just uh, bear that in mind uh, for the future. Just in case it wasn't clear up at the front or after this episode, now you know. And you know what? Knowing is half the battle. Enjoy. We've kind of gone this, this whole time without actually talking about what you're currently doing, but I feel like now's a really good time. Tell, tell me a little bit about what you're doing at uh, Hairbrain Schemes now. I am the narrative, desi narrative designer on Battletech. Actually, some of my work is going to be in the next update, actually, uh, Flashpoint. And so narrative design is a little different, you know, strictly from, you know, writing a world setting or a module uh, or a short story for that matter. Um, you have these, you know, what I'm working on is a lot of sort of micro bite-sized fiction moments that involve choice. Um, so that's a, that's a pretty key difference is uh, sort of the scale and the interactivity of it. It's like tabletop RPGs are actually really interactive. It's just like a different way of thinking about it. You're like trying to give people as many like tools and ideas to sort of inspire them when they play versus like yeah. in a video game obviously you have a set amount of options you can give someone typically three to four uh mm -hmm. and you're trying to find how you could you know satisfy sort of the player's desires to express their character through those mm -hmm. choices while also tying it to mechanics where you're like oh well you know Will this cost them, you know, mech tech points? Or will this actually make this pilot, after you scold them, make them less dependable? Will it make them rebellious? Will it, you know, turn out that then they start stealing from you? And so with narrative design, you have to think more about sort of the systems in place and um, the different ways they can interact. And also you need to make sure, you know, you're, you're communicating, you know, you're forecasting the effects of your choice. Like if you're going to give someone a choice that potentially like, kills a pilot or makes them lose like a ton of money or something like you need to find ways to make sure that's clear or else like if they don't know why they're choosing something and what the possible consequences are then they're going to stop caring about reading it i can see where you have that fine balance between your where your your mechanics and your story uh especially in this kind of landscape yeah i'll be honest it's challenging in a good way it's been challenging to sort of take on this form of writing um because it is different and it does require a different set of skills and i've really been enjoying uh yeah. being better and better at it and i'm very fortunate to be at a place where i've actually this is the first time i've gotten a uh job where it was like oh you just read documents play the game don't work on anything like there's actually been like an on-ramping which is just like mind-blowing to me um, versus wow. like everything else I've done, you just like they throw you into the fire and you're inventing <laughs> everything along the way. Well, that's good. It's it's nice that you have at least a, a pretty clear uh, directive as to what you're trying to accomplish. It's yeah, it's, um, <laughs> this is the first time where I'm just like working on actually working on one thing. So it's like mm. I'm actually writing events and just focusing on events and testing events. Um, and so events, if you haven't played BattleTech. Uh, are when you are uh, outside of like the the combat and you're you know you're up in the Argo in space and you're traveling around and you're you know repairing things and whatever um, mm -hmm. events pop up and give you these sort of 
there's these little sort of moments where it's like, oh, hey, uh, you know, Decker just punched Behemoth in the face. Uh, how do you want to handle this? You know, those kind of moments. Uh, carefully. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. They can have they can have some serious uh, consequences potentially. Now, uh, what I'm kind of fascinated, like I, one, it's kind of neat because I didn't know this going in, is that you you've kind of come full circle because you started working with Hairbrained on one thing, and now you're back doing something completely different for them. Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of crazy. That whole, you've you've cycled crazy. Yeah, you've done that whole cycle in in pretty short time. It's been five years, you know. To put it in context, it's you know, five? It, it seems like a short time and a long time. It's both, um, it but it is. took five years to actually like truly work on a video game project. <laughs> yeah, that is a huge like discography if i guess i could i, I don't have another term i can use for, it, for like <laughs> yeah. a five-year term <laughs> uh, it's a it's kind of a a weird cv yeah weird resume kind of thing uh it's all over the place but it all like revolved around storytelling in one way or the other you know that was always the focus of of what i was doing and it's weird like i couldn't like i couldn't recreate you know this path um, it's been just like moving through a lot of side doors and stuff. Having gone through that whole path where you worked on Seven Sphere and worked in Hyper and all of those sort of, uh, you know, tabletop projects, how has that informed uh, what you're doing now back in the digital space? I think one of the one of the coolest parts of working at Hyper RPG was just getting to know more about um, gaming culture. Like this is like the most tuned in I was to like everything happening you know, every game that was coming out. Um, and it exposed me to a lot of different, especially role-playing game uh, systems and to a lot of different role players who had different styles. And so I feel like I grew a lot. I grew a lot um, from just being there, like just just sitting on the camera. But yeah, so just like watching, so watching different storytellers work in their own ways, different DMs, GMs, whatever they call themselves these days. And uh, Satellite, radio. <laughs> yeah, XMs. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, it exposed me to a lot of different play styles. It made me more aware of the different things people like want and look for from games. And it, it really expanded just my understanding, like the vast and really diverse set of gamers out there. Like, I think it's really easy to get like caught up in this sort of poor gamer of, you know, just thinking about like classic 20 year old white dude. Uh, cis hetero male guy which there's still plenty of us out here i'm here clearly yep um we are too but no i just <laughs> yeah <laughs> to confirm uh, to confirm yeah yeah it showed me showed me a lot of different different ways that people play games and why they play games uh and as for seven sphere like working with brian uh was really amazing because i came on as a freelancer while i was working at hyper rpg i would spend my weekends uh, working on Open Legend, and uh, you know, from the from the beginning, um, he was just really uh, supportive and really collaborative, and he just you know gave me more and more responsibility and leadership, and so I felt like I really I really grew as a writer. Um, I grew a lot more confident and obviously a lot more experienced from that, and. It, it also pushed me to like try some new genres where working on Shores of Valhalla, well, it's still fantasy. I had to do a lot more historical research about Norse mythology right. Um, right. or working on, uh, what was, ooh, what was the other one? Um, Luminos. So Luminos was a science fiction uh, setting, uh, which also I think will be coming out soon. I know some of these, these Kickstarter rewards are still coming out. Yeah, I don't know. So it pushed me to explore some different genres. Um, and it was the first time I worked with other writers. When you, when you're talking about like working with other writers, um, how, how is that different? Like when you're in a collaborative experience rather than just writing by yourself, wh what do you have to think about? Well, I think the, the first thing is that like video games are incredibly collaborative. They're way more collaborative than, than mm. tabletop because they take so many more people to make, you know, you have this intersection of art and technology, you have all these engineers, you have artists, and then you have like, the, it gets very specific where like one person's job may be like, like rigging things up or just working on the animations and one person's just working on the models and one person and probably a bunch of people are working on the environments. And so like, there has to be a lot more collaboration because you always have to be thinking about how these things are, are intersecting and like, you can't do it all where uh, in tabletop, you could, you can kind of 
sort of do it all. Um, yeah. At least I felt like more like I had to, and it was still possible to do so successfully. Um, but there's just no way about uh, no way avoiding collaboration if you're working on a video game. I mean, if you are avoiding collaboration, you're probably gonna make a bad bad video game. And it's awesome because people there's people who know so much more than you do about uh, their individual expertises, and even like in working with other writers, like every writer has a different skill set, has a different style, different taste that you can learn from and grow from and just obviously having someone to like bounce things off of having someone to like right. check you and be like ah this feels this feels sort of unclear or you know this yeah. this is just sort of uh muddy writing like that kind of stuff goes a long way so like what i'm kind of getting is if you're if you're looking at like the video game kind of uh model you have a lot of collaboration that's like behind the scenes and it feels like in a tabletop uh it's really in front of the camera like you're doing a lot of independent stuff behind the scenes and then you have a collaborative experience sort of like at the end because you have all the players that are involved uh do you mean with like like, like the actual collaborative experience like it, it feels like for a video game that's that's behind the scenes before the game is in the hands of like an end user it's with mm -hmm. the with the tech and with uh with a tabletop game you know you're working on like building a world and doing all of that stuff and then it becomes a collaborative experience at the end oh you players. mean like when it when it's sort of brought to your players and they're they're right. taking it on and using it yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's yeah. definitely tabletop, you know, uh, hopefully I didn't uh, make it sound like there isn't collaboration in tabletop, because there's plenty, you know, you're working right. with a bunch of different artists, right. uh, working with different writers, working with, like, sure, the, sure. the designer, um, but there's just there's just less moving parts. Um, right, right. But yeah, the cool thing about a tabletop RPG and, like, really my philosophy and how I, I wrote, uh, how I write them, is that I don't want to write a complete story. When I write mm -hmm. in tabletop RPG content, I want to try to write something up to the point to like something amazing or crazy or scary uh, or horrible is about to happen. Like I want to go as close as I can to the climax without like yeah. robbing it of momentum and then hand it off to the players and the GMs yeah. and let them take that where they, they want to go. I don't want them to have to feel like they have to learn all this history. Not that history can't get woven into there and should be woven in, into there. Um, but my primary goal is to create something that immediately sort of pushes people into telling their own story. So yeah, I think that's that's the great thing about a tabletop RPG is that it's a tool that allows other people to have creative expression. This is the this, this is the big question I wanted to ask you. The biggest now, of it, questions. It, it, it's, <laughs> and oh it, it, it's it it's the big question, uh, and it's specifically for you. What do you think? Um, video games can learn from tabletop games, and what do you think tabletop games can learn from video games? Ooh, wow! Saving points. <laughs> I did kind of want saving points in tabletop games. Good point, but this is a this is a doozy. This yeah. is a great question. Ooh. Um, I feel like I'm gonna have a much better answer in a year. Give me a year, and then I'll come back and we'll then we'll, you'll come we'll back and we'll, we'll, we'll edit the answer in, and and you can yeah, find the release. We'll, we'll take episode. a time machine. I think tabletop could learn a lot from video games in that video games are better at onboarding. You know, they have more tools to tutorialize and they have UIs to show you how, you know, the mechanics work. And I think we're definitely tabletop RPGs and tabletop games in general have gotten better at this. You know, the rule books are definitely written better. Like the writing in tabletop RPGs right now is like, I don't know if it could get any better. It's so good everywhere from, mm. you know, a one pager to a smaller indie book to, you know, the latest fifth edition stuff being put out by Dungeons yeah. and Dragons. Like we are definitely in a golden age, but it, I still think fundamentally the process of getting someone into you know, first time player into RPGs isn't much better than it was 40 years ago. I've seen some tabletop games include like uh, Root. This is an example, not an RPG, but it include like tutorialized, uh, tutorialized uh, turns where it explained, OK, here's what you're going to do in your first turn and your second turn. And then you can now you can do whatever you want on your third turn to like show you how the mechanics of that game work. And so I guess, you know, you what I would advocate more for is like more intro modules, but just more thought being put into the people who haven't played RPGs. Cause I think there's so many more 
people in the world who would love to play a tabletop RPG or want to play, but they don't they don't know how, how to get started or because yes. of the way that uh, tabletop is right now, especially kind of being dominated by D&D, that actually pushes a lot of people away because mm. they think, oh, it's only fantasy or it's only like what I think D&D is when it's like, right. it's such a vast amount of experiences you can have. And so the more, I guess, you know, <laughs> that's a harder thing for <laughs> to change. That's more of like a, a more industry economic issue. Right, uh, but I think just in general, we could definitely do a better job introducing players to their first RPG experience. Yeah, I, I get that because when people, I think at, from an outsider's perspective, you think about like, oh yeah, tabletop RPGs. Automatically, it's pretty much D and D. Like that's the the automatic thing that you think of, and you don't realize that it's actually there's tons of other things out there. If that doesn't necessarily appeal to you, yeah. What if I don't? What if I don't want to play medieval fantasy uh, combat simulator? You right. know, it's like yeah. D and D is a great system, but it's not the only system, and yeah. there's so many other ways to play an RPG. Right. But for right. every RPG could be better, you know, little or small, at just introducing someone into how it all works and not making any assumptions about what someone knows when they open yeah. your book. And uh, what what can uh, video games learn from tabletop? Nothing. We know everything. No. Okay. We know. Uh, we have knowledge <laughs> checks for that. Now that I'm working on a video game, it's perfect. There's no issues. Can't take this away. <laughs> From like a writer perspective, so you know, when I was like looking, when I was in LA, and I stopped working at Seven Sphere, and I was looking for like, uh, what's you know my next game job going to be, and like everyone wanted to hire a. Uh, script writer which a screenwriter which is great but i just thought that was so weird that like there was no i felt almost like it was either neutral to a detriment uh how much uh experience i had with tabletop or how little it mattered um to most game companies obviously some game companies will be different people who are making you know divinity original sin or the witcher might feel a little differently uh about those things but like i think that there are a lot of really great, talented people in tabletop who could and should be working on uh, video game projects. And I know definitely some of them have made that jump. So that that's my advice, is video game companies need to hire more tabletop uh, RPG right. writers and creators, I guess. <laughs> right, right, right. That doesn't seem self-serving. <laughs> no, wink, wink. I'm not saying anything. I think that's true because you see so much great creativity and artistry in, in tabletop and uh Yeah, and ingenuity. You're working with so little. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes yeah, absolutely. you're working with nothing. You pretty much always are. <laughs> and imagine what happens if you give people who are used to working with nothing a whole tool set to work with. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I I see a lot of people that are kind of like working in both realms and that's kind of nice, you know. It does feel like mm-hmm. it, at least at least, you know, like, okay, I, I, maybe I play video games, but, you know, I'm going to see a lot of names that pop up sort mm-hmm. of in the tabletop space, too, because they, they work on some similar projects. So is, is, is there anything that you're, you're really excited about that I, I haven't thought to ask about Pandas. that you want to talk about? I don't know. I think in general, shout out to like the indie RPG world. Like the people who inspire mm. me the most right now are people who are putting out uh, really small really focused games uh yeah and like the larp community oh my god there's so many amazing people um so i don't know i'm like how do i how do i say just get more into indie rpgs play rpgs without dice play rpgs with one die or two die i just want Mm -hmm. everyone to experience the vast and awesome world of uh oh yeah i approve of this message (laughs) (laughs) alex approves (laughs) terrific um, Whew, okay, I was th- I thought I was gonna get through all oh. this, this whole podcast and not get an Alex approval. Yeah, I mean well, it was close. <laughs> Maybe sweat. That's Ooh, the point. shake really it off. Make you think. Shake it off. Shake, shake it, it up. Off. Shake it up. No, that's something different. We're not talking about Taylor Tadoff Swiftler. <laughs> no, no, nope. no, no, no. We haven't done that for a while, and I'm not bringing it back. Sorry. We're not, <laughs> we're not going back to that. So, uh, Ryan, if uh, if anyone's looking to get some more information about, like, uh, Harebrained or, or 
battle pack you know where where can they go to find more info uh well i'm easy uh I, if you want to see uh mostly selfies occasional thoughts actually about uh games and writing when whenever that actually happens uh i am on twitter it is just uh r s oh dude i don't even know my own twitter account anymore Guys, all right, cut it all, cut it all. <laughs> cut the entire episode. <laughs> My brain. I'm ready to trade brains now. All right, all yeah. right. I'm going to see brain, if I can brain. borrow someone else's really quick. <laughs> Beautiful. Okay, you can find me on Twitter. Uh, it's just Ryan Shapples. That's R-Y-A-N-S-C-H-A-P-A-L-S. Super easy and catchy. That's my handle. Uh, also, you can find more about Battletech over at harebrained Schemes. Dot com. Um, the new Flashpoint uh, update is actually going to be coming out really soon. The Linux beta just came out, um, and there's going to be a lot of other uh, cool things happening with Battletech. Um, so if you ever wanted to check out Giant Smashing Robots, if you like tactical RPGs, if you like turn-based, uh, thoughtful combat, this will be this will be for you. I uh, I gotta say, like this is this is going to be like very self-serving, but I had 15 hours in the game coming into this weekend and now i'm at 25 nice very nice I'm doing work i'm addicted <laughs> that's where you can find that all out um just to kind of give me an idea of the gameplay of, of battle tech uh do i is, is it kind of similar to like a xcom like that kind yes. of yes oh my gosh you could definitely think of it as being similar to xcom i think that's, okay that's a great reference because i played both xcoms and i really like those games so this is right up my alley. yes and i th- i think you'll feel less anger at the rng Sometimes it'll still get you. Right. It's less cruel. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I got very used to an XCOM just like reloading my game every time somebody died because I couldn't deal with having to to move forward without my my corporal. There's a yeah, there's a there's a famous uh sort of quote about that pretty much sums up how the universe works and it's like uh what is it? It's like Nope, it's gone. It's like meat is cheap. Meat is cheap, and all right, what is it? It's, something else is not. Guys, this clearly we've reached the end of the podcast because I'm yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> done. My brain's gone. Brains, brains. brains. Yeah, that brains. usually happens about two hours in. That's good. A- Alex, if they want to find out more information about Delve, where can they go? You can find more information about Delve over at delvecast dot com. And uh, there you can find Delve, and you can find Orbital and Attempting to Play, and all the other things that I do in my free time when I <laughs> when I get around to it. Being the, whatever title I've given myself now, the production manager. I am the production manager. I just gotta point out that, like, Alex, you just, you and Nathan just nailed your outros perfectly. Pirouette, you know, landed on the banister after, Thank like, you. I struggled to get mine out. Uh, so you guys are... <laughs> Great professionals. We don't always nail the outro. No, <laughs> no, our hit ratio is pretty low, but tonight, tonight we hit it. So that's always good. Uh, and uh, while you're there, maybe click on the Patreon banner. We have some special stuff over there for you. And we're uh, working on it. We're working on it. We're we're always coming up with stuff that we want to give to our patrons. Nathan's gonna do a live stream for seventy three hours. Oh yeah, totally. That's uh yeah. If we get Look. if we get ten patron supporters at the one dollar level, <laughs> and then you get all his outtakes turned into an auto tune song as well. Yeah, exactly. It's perfect. You look forward to that live stream when I become like a brain in a jar, like from Fallout. I'll be I'll be like a robo brain. Once I get to that stage, I can totally do a seventy three hour live stream. Uh, and uh, thank you to our shiny level patrons, Bonnie Ainsworth and Dominic Perry. Uh, and uh, you can find us on all podcast apps. It's uh, iTunes and Google Play and. I, I th- I can't even remember all the other ones that we're on. We're on them. And most importantly, thank you guys for having me on this podcast, on the Dell Podcast. My first time. Yes, yes. It, it's, uh, it's so wonderful to finally have you on uh, because, uh, you know, I, I needed an excuse is really what it, it came down to. And when I realized that you had just started uh, over at Hairbrained, I was like, oh, perfect opportunity. There's my excuse. You know, you know, we can always talk and not record our conversations. Uh, oh, that that's true. We could then you get the do that. then you get the better stories. You know, that's, that's you can always join us on a live show if you want to. We do those sometimes. We do a we live do. show. We we oh, occasionally uh, live stream or are just chatting with people about whatever the fuck we want. Yeah, it's it's that not great. 
it's not visually exciting because it's basically our Discord channel. We're, we're working on that too. <laughs> we're, we're trying to figure out something better. For maybe that. maybe one of but, us will play a game as we live stream it so that people that can listen to us do. talk as someone games. Some, someone. That's it's, pretty crazy sounding. So you're going to yeah. be talking and playing a game at the same time. That will never work. No, no, it will never work. Especially if it's co-op. You're not making me play co-op again, Alex. Just for the record. <laughs> I just heard the, the, the chuckle. Oh, that was great. That was sad. Six um, hours of co-op. No, oh, no. God. Oh, God. Again, just really want to thank Ryan for, for gracing us with your presence. I know that you're incredibly busy and very prolific, and I'm very glad that you were able to make time for us. Oh man, I'm so glad you invited me. This was this yeah. was super fun. Um, yeah, basically have me back anytime. Nice. Perfect. Tell Tomorrow. all your friends. <laughs> Tomorrow. <laughs> Tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, every single episode is now the Ryan Shaples hour and you enjoy. <laughs> oh my Alex. god, I should just be like, hey, the, all those indie RPG people that I should have shouted out, I should just give you their names and be like, please have them on. Yeah, absolutely. Just we, we have a lot of indie people on the show. Most so, of the people we have on are indie people. Most of the people we have on are indie, indie people. people. Are the best. Yes, you see the best innovation from them. They've been wonderful to work with. We're also very happy when we have people that are, you know, prolific in the industry, such as yourself, sir. You know. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Well, <laughs> at, the, at the very least, the things keep coming out. They haven't stopped me yet. We will be looking forward to that. And uh, and and thank you for being on. And uh, as always. Thank you all for joining us on the show, and we will see you next time. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. What uh, what episode are you guys on, by the way? How oh, how shit. long are we into Delve right now? Where are we at? Oh, we've done at least three of these. Uh, no, actually, <laughs> actually, <laughs> actually, when when we get this, <laughs> we've done at least three episodes. 